Perfect. I assume that's a great time to start. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming to this very large room um, where we will be presenting on Chef's Cuisine and Convergence. Um, we have five presenters today, four of whom are here, and one of whom um, has a video presentation because the United States would not let him in the country. So um, those presenters will be Sina Skolborg, me, myself, Lee Bush, Amir Sayadabdi, Amanda Sophie Green, John A. Nihul, and our discussant, Greg de Saint Maurice. Um, today we'll start with Sina from the University of Copenhagen. Her paper is titled Hopping and Soy Like, Developing a Feel for Insects in a Nordic Food Lab. Thank you so much. I'm sorry, five person here? Correct. All right, thank you. Um, right, so thank you for, to the organizers for um, organizing this panel, sorry, and um, for having me on it, of course. Um, my paper has actually been retitled, so it's now been called Insects at the Edges on Food and Animal in Nordic Food Innovation. And I have a bit of a sore throat, um, so apologies for that. Um, we'll just see how it goes. Right, okay. Um, in 2013, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations wrote a report on the topic of edible insects. The report was called Edible Insects, Future Prospects for Food and Food Security. In the report, researchers advocated for an integration of insects into global, but particularly Western diets, both those of animals and humans. Pointing to the strains put on the world's ecosystems as a result of mass production and farming, the report made the general claim that quote, we need to find new ways of growing food, end quote. Eating insects, the report argues, and in particular the high levels of protein they contain, can play a substantial part in solving both immediate issues of hunger and future issues of sustainable food production. Two years later, I encountered this argument in the flesh during fieldwork at a workshop in Copenhagen, Denmark. Again, this need to finally start eating insects, this largely overlooked but highly nutritious resource, gathered scientists and politicians alike in heated debate. As the workshop went on, however, the imperative of eating insects because of their nutritional value was overrun by a concern for palatability, or rather a lack thereof, as questions were raised as to whether or not insects could actually become something that the people of Denmark would enjoy eating. What was referred to in the FAO report as the disgust factor became an issue in need of handling as presenters and participants at the workshop all seemed to agree that edibility does not simply equal what goes in the mouth, however justified from a nutritional point of view. As it were, the organizers had a clever solution to this. As part of the workshop, a Copenhagen-based food lab working with Nordic Food Innovation had been invited to prepare a tasty insect snack made from grasshoppers. The snack had two elements. One was a cupful of warm, fragrant broth with a small green piece of chervil floating around in it. The other was a whole freeze-dried grasshopper sitting in the saucer beneath the cup of broth as a biscuit to a cup of tea. The smell of the broth was meaty enough that I wouldn't necessarily have guessed its main ingredient had I not been informed. In contrast, the freeze-dried and scentless grasshopper was easily recognizable as such. In this paper, I want to explore the tension of familiar strange, or perhaps rather of sameness and difference, as relative to the specific ways in which the insects become recognized as foods to be eaten rather than animals to be avoided. More specifically, I present two episodes from my fieldwork in the food lab during which I worked with the researchers in producing some of the components that go into their grasshopper broth. In engaging these episodes, um, I hope to show how the insects move and sometimes are even held in suspense between the categories of animal and food. In the lab, these categories are not distinct, but instead form an analytical scale that the researchers work in different ways in order to make the insects edible. In other words, and going back to the rhetoric of the FAO report, growing food, in the case of a food lab, or so at least I will argue, becomes a matter of working the scale between food and animal. Right, so the first episode I've just called the lab. The food lab is located at the science faculty of the University of Copenhagen. It was conceived by the head chef of the famous restaurant Noma, who founded the lab in 2008 together with a mix of social entrepreneurs and scientists 
the point being to facilitate the space for the exploration of Nordic tastes and terroirs. Since their opening, the affiliation to Noma has brought great attention to the lab in times of high gastronomic popularity, which has opened up lots of doors for the researchers in terms of work collaborations um, in the business, uh, restaurant business in particular. However, the team of researchers who work here are equally interested in capitalizing on the scientific work they do as well, and not only being a place where strange things are cooked, as is often the coining of their work in the public press. Consequently, the lab occupies a self-made space between science lab and restaurant test kitchen. Physically, the lab consists of two main rooms, a kitchen and an adjacent room with a big meeting table. And as I enter the lab for the first time, a glass bottle with the label antigen captures my eye. As I have a look around, I notice that the two rooms indeed make for a curious kind of environment. The lab is filled with objects from both science and gastronomy. Cured ham and meats hang from the ceiling, some looking more edible than others. Countless bottles and boxes with vegetables, seeds, spices, cuts of meats, ants, larvae, beer, and a vast number of other types of produce in different stages of fermentation and preserving. The walls are decorated with sign posters, science posters depicting de developmental stages in gene expressions over time. Others show metabolic relations between species or different kinds of produce. Holding a space that's intentionally somewhere in between rigorous science and practical cooking takes active effort, one of the researchers tells me. But if they can manage, then the payoff is really good. It's a balance, he says, between following the trail down the rabbit hole in search of historical background and making short instructions for people who just want to cook and utilize the recipes. This predicament of balancing different knowledge forms and their relevance is also noticeable in the structure of the team itself. One is, a trained, one is trained in the humanities department, another is a trained chef, a third is a century scientist, and so on. Quite fittingly, the countless bottles and jars almost mimic this logic of being informed by two ends of a scale. The cured legs of ham um, hanging from the ceiling can potentially be put in relation with both their animal of origin and the potential dinner plates and side dishes they are to be eaten from and with. Conversely, the ants in the antigen also seem to be at once forest and festivity, depending on your point of view, although the amalgamation of these particular parts into one product is a bit more exotic, at least in the context of Nordic food. Indeed, separation and amalgamation combine, as the lab, in order to separate themselves out from other labs and other test kitchens, must mix carefully disciplines, techniques, and organic material. Suspending cuts of meat or alcoholic liquids in between food and animal, making context of origin, Mixing context of origin with context of application is integral to their analytical register. As such, this self-made space upheld by the lab not only makes possible, but rather necessitates this kind of curiosity and experimentation, and particular kind of attention to the animal in the food and vice versa. Second episode, killing and sorting. The lead researcher picks me up outside the lab late one evening. Me himself, himself and an intern are going to make an invention of the lab that they call garum. Garum is a liquid in the style of soy or fish sauce, only this one is made from insects and used for seasoning broths like the one I had at the workshop. We go through the deserted after hours halls of the science faculty into the warm and dimly lit food lab. On the floor of the kitchen, a giant box is sitting filled with smaller boxes and cardboard cylinders. An intern is opening up the boxes, which are filled with crickets, grasshoppers, and wax moth larvae. The lab gets the insects fresh from Germany, and it isn't until I approach this giant box of boxes that I realize they indeed are fresh. Up close, when I put my head towards the cardboard, there is a noticeable rumble and hassle going on between the inhabitants. I ask the researcher why they're still alive. Why not just kill them before they're shipped? He tells me that this is both cheaper for the lab, but it also makes it possible for them to control the process as they know exactly what has happened to the insects and when. The researcher asks me to help open the boxes of larvae. Just start from one end and work your way across, he suggests. I grab a pair of cutting pliers and get to it, hoping the insects will not come at me full speed once presented with an opportunity to escape. The larvae, it turns out, are not so agile. When we finish opening up all of the boxes, we talk about what insects to kill first. 
The preferred method of killing is by pouring liquid nitrogen over the insects, glazing them, as a researcher calls it, and killing them immediately. Other than being a humane way of killing these cold-blooded creatures, this method also turns out to be particularly practical when it comes to the grass, grasshoppers and crickets due to its effectiveness in preventing escapees. Concerned with this, the intern asks whether we should start, quote, with the ones that hop or the ones that don't hop, end quote. We decide to start, uh, we decide to start with the wax moth larvae. They can almost just be poured out of the cylinder straight into the blaze, blazing bowl in which they now sit in a big pile, looking like beige globules. Feel how soft they are against your hands when you run your fingers through them, the researcher instructs. It takes some effort for me to run my fingers through living larvae, but when I finally do, I have to agree with him. They're soft and silky to the touch, and I can tell this has a positive effect on the rest of my working with them, as I'm simply not as apprehensive about the whole thing as I was to begin with. The intern holds the bowl steady while the researcher carefully pours the nitrogen over the larvae until they solidify and separate. The researcher stirs a couple of times around the bowl to make sure nothing and no one is still alive. When all are surely dead, the larvae are distributed onto large trays on a steel table in the middle of the kitchen. Now the sorting begins. This is the most strenuous part, the intern says. She goes to her laptop at the back of the room and puts on some music. As arcade fire blasts away in the back, we gather around the table and start picking out all the impurities, or fluff, as they are called. Miscellaneous parts of the larvae, or even small pieces of cardboard that have separated during the freeze blast, and which are not wanted in the garum. The researcher sits on, t on the table on top of his legs, and the intern and myself are crouching over the trays on the table, and together we pick through the cold and nubbly piles of dead larvae. When all the impurities have been removed and only the clean larvae remain, they are put into the oven to thaw. When they are soft and squidgy again, they are transported back into a thermal blender and turned into beige pasty mass, which is measured and then added to fermented barley, the combination of which will initiate bacterial activity resulting in umami or meaty flavors, as tasted at the workshop. The lot is then put into containers and sealed off with cling wrap like it was leftovers from a meal in any ordinary household. The containers will then be left alone for the next three months inside flamingo boxes with thermometers set at 38.5 exactly degrees Celsius, during which a clear liquid will have formed, which hopefully will resemble soil fish sauce in taste. In the practices of killing and sorting, practicality and aesthetics combine. The insects pose a specific set of concerns in terms of agility, speed, number, and size, which have to be handled throughout these practices. <coughs> throughout these practices. Concerns um, which are specific to these particular kinds of animal. Attending also to the aesthetics of silkiness and to feel and to the development of umami becomes an important part of understanding the process of transformation that's going on and that will eventually turn the insects into food food that are the result of working the particular sensory qualities of wax moth larvae as opposed to other insects, for example. In the food lab, the line between animal and food isn't a hard line, but rather one that's in a kind of conversation with itself, as the different insects go in and out of boxes, bowls, ovens and blenders in an equally challenging and well-timed traffic. Right. Concluding remarks, which I've chosen to call salty liquids. When we meet again after the mixtures have rested, the researcher opens a drawer in a middle cupboard and pulls out a variety of small flasks. Some have been sealed off with a yellow wax in order to keep air from furthering their bacterial development. Others have been opened and have small pipettes attached in the top. The labels read things like malt pea sauce. Another, which I helped made, reads grasshopper garum. Both of them have very detailed descriptions of what went into the bottles and when. The researcher puts a few drops from one of the bottles onto the top of my hand. Eat that, he says. It tastes salty, but with a deep, meaty flavor that keeps developing in my mouth. Animal has become food, or rather, the object in and on my hand has become recognizable as such. In the food lab, where being in between is also occupying the frontier of Nordic innovation, the evident transformation of the insects happened not by a one-way domestication of the wild, 
but by allowing also for the insects to have an effect on the researchers in the sense of paying attention, for example, to how their sensory qualities might resemble already existing foods and consequently require specific handling. Edibility, here in the case of a salty liquid, congregates at the edges as turning objects familiar as animal into objects familiar as food requires working at the seams of both. Thank you. Thank you, Sina. I was going to say that we'd like to save all the questions for the end if possible so that we can have our discussant um, facilitate and everyone can have their questions together. Um, next up is me, Lee Bush from Indiana University, and I will be talking about uh, chef's cuisine and convergence. Okay, um, as I said, my name is Lee and I'm from the Food Studies Program at Indiana University. And um, I wanted to bring treats here actually because usually I do that when I'm in a classroom, but um, I figured bringing brownies to the Mile High City was probably a bad idea. So we'll have to go decide on our own pleasure afterwards. Um, anyway, let me see if I can get my presentation running from the computer. Are you able to get that up back there? Aha. So that's my desktop for those boots on the farm. Um, I'm not sure why the internet isn't grabbing. Fantastic. Yes. Thank you. All right. Okay, there we are. Chef's Cuisine and Convergence, Authenticity in the Age of Prosumerism. Um, so my dissertation work is just sort of in its uh, nascent phase. I welcome feedback on any of this, and I'm sort of just starting to link these ideas together. They're coming from three separate field sites across the city of Chicago. Um, so having 15 minutes to present this is a little bit of a squash for me. Um, anyway, I am exploring how the democratization of technology and new media has facilitated the fusion of producer and consumer, creating what has been referred to as the prosumer, and further considering how our lived experience is affected in ways that fuse the real with the virtual. I look at this issue from the three field sites of production, first from the perspective of creative new media producers, second from the perspective of food producers, and lastly, from the perspective of app developers. To begin, for the purposes of this presentation, I would like to refer to new media as those media produced, distributed, or consumed via computerized technology. Um, according to Castells, a media scholar, new media has been so interwoven with contemporary human culture and society that it represents the social fabric of our lives. Such technologies are often considered to be extensions of the self and according to Marshall McLuhan, they are prostheses of the senses, a notion that has given way to some scholars referring to all modern humans as hybrid machine organisms or cyborgs. I for one felt superhuman once I got LASIK and uh, look forward to my new knees at age 35. So I'm an appreciative cyborg myself. 
With the pursuit of meaning at the core of anthropology, understanding how new media operates as we become hybrid individuals is essential to realizing the human experience. New media is at once ephemeral, iterative, and infinite. It is both fluid and fragmented, and perhaps mo most importantly, it is instant and interactive. These oppositions complicate our own ability to make sense of the world, distinguishing what is meaningful from what is noise. Meanwhile, as new media and its associated devices have made their way from cultural capital to human essential, cooking and its prodigy child cuisine have made their way from human essential to cultural capital. United, our choices in terms of food and media and food media establish a vast network of communicative and consumerist power. In 2013, the Food Network reached 99 million homes, accounting, amounting to 75% of households, that's up to 83% now actually, um, in the US and ranking just third after the Weather Channel and CNN. Meanwhile, the internet and new media more generally has one crucial advantage over more traditional media. The internet has exponentially increased the concept of media consumer as collaborator or co-creator. As consumers begin to assert their own control over cultural flows, directing these flows is one major intention of media outlets and producers like the Food Network. In the attention economy, interactivity is an essential way to engage with those individuals who both consume and produce media. Interactive users and prosumers are not only more likely to stay engaged with media, but they also add content for free to engage with others across the mediascape. This change has led scholars like Mark Dews to say the following. The combination of mastering news gathering and storytelling techniques in all media formats, so-called so multi-skilling, as well as the integration of digital network technologies, coupled with a rethinking of the news producer-consumer relationship, tends to be seen as one of the biggest challenges facing journalism studies and education in the 21st century. From social media like Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to blogs, podcasts, and online publications to public rating and reservation websites like Yelp and OpenTable, voices from and opinions on even the smallest eateries abound. Especially in populous food savvy cities, yuppies sit in cafes or on trains and unfortunately in their cars, promoting and commenting on tweets, grams, and Facebook posts, marking the emergence of a new national pastime. There are more than 178 million photos on Instagram hashtagged food, and over 56 million that are hashtagged food porn. The convergence of new food culture and new media has pulled even the local chef into the public spotlight in its creation of the celebrity chef. Whereas once only top contending restaurants awaited reviews in the local paper, and even fewer received national media attention, new media forms have enabled mass participation in our food worlds from the global to the local level through any number of platforms. The participatory element of dining and reviewing has revolutionized both the restaurant and journalism industry. Once gatekeepers of what the public sees, hears, and reads about, their expertise has been fragmented and ceded to the public, including the chefs who themselves, whether willfully or not, have been pulled from the back to the front of the house. For the first six months of my field research, I participant observed at the Third Coast International Audio Festival on Navy Pier in downtown Chicago, Illinois. Third Coast collects and produces sound-rich audio stories from, that form part of an online library and are featured on a national radio show and podcast. Their annual conference and festival honoring the best of the best audio documentaries is widely considered to be the Sundance of the radio world. While audio media is not new, technology change has catapulted its re-entrance into the daily lives of media consumers. The podcast invented in 2004 has undergone an 11 to 23% increase in listenership between 2006 and 2010. Audio stories like those featured on TCIAF are mostly narrated through dialogue, a dramatic structure proven to excite and engage listeners more fully and imaginatively than a traditional omniscient narration. Producers also construct their stories using a wealth of story building sound effects to construct the audio environment, building an intimacy between listener and story that has been mimicked across the mediascape. The podcast itself is transportable via multiple 
multimedia devices, contributing to its emergence from the domestic sphere into the active lives of daily consumers. Combined with the seemingly more emotional, temporal sense of immediacy that goes with orality and pervasive sense of liveness, this format exemplifies how we use our media to extend ourselves in very real ways into new communities. Let's see. So here I'm going to start talking about new media production, which is my first field site. The bridging together of producer and consumer and distributor is highlighted in Third Coast's biannual short docs challenge, in which amateur and professional audio producers are invited to submit three minute pieces according to a theme. In 2013, Third Coast partnered with the James Beard Foundation, the most prestigious award-giving organization for food production in the US, to host this, that year's competition on the theme of appetite. Crossing borders even further, the five winning producers were each paired with one of five local chefs who prepared a dish inspired by their piece to be presented and tasted on stage in front of a live audience. Of the winning stories, all evoked an emotional response from the audience. In addition to the live audio feast, listeners were also invited to participate online by voting for their favorite, which received the People's Short Docs Award. Voters commented regarding their selections, revealed their appreciation for authenticity and topics that hearkened to the nostalgia for history and the natural world, connections also ripe for memory in the realm of food. Comments to this effect were, just hearing John describe the taste activated my salivary glands. Plus, just hearing John's recounting of this childhood recollection was also like biting into something savory and immediately having a long forgotten fond memory triggered. Of the winning stories, one featured an old man reminiscing about blackbird pie in the era of hucksters. While in another, we found a newborn awakening to a bottle of warm milk. A non-narrated piece brought us through the audio experience of killing and butchering a pig. And while a fourth finds us listening to an impassioned French aunt instruct us on the only proper way to make true poutine. So right here. Um, so I'm going to play a little bit of the one of the pieces, the one about blackbirds, so you can hear um, sort of the evocative narration that the audio producer uses. And what you'll see um, in front of you is actually a picture of the pie that was made by the chef um, and presented on stage, inspired by this piece. Sing a song of six hens, pockets full of rice. I got blackbirds, I got blackbirds. <laughs> Norris Pugh was a huckster. He used to sell blackbirds in his push cart for 50 cents a peach basketful. See, hucksters would come around when everything was in season. Blackbirds, catfish, clams, vegetables, muskrats, whatever. So um, I talked to many of the people who produced pieces for this competition, and um, interviews with producers revealed that this level of storytelling did not come easily. Eggs were broken over and over again for the perfect crack um, to be recorded. Hours of audio were trimmed and reworked, and perhaps the biggest disappointment to all on our staff and a fact that we never revealed to the audience, the passionate poutine ant turned out to be one producer's French teacher reading from a transcript. In the hunt for the most compelling story, it seemed that assembling a real food audio experience involved a lot of technique and fabrication. Moving from food and eating as a tool for storytelling, I changed field sites to a place where storytelling is a tool for the production and consumption of food. Following one chef, the one whose dish was featured on this last slide, to his restaurant, I worked as an assistant where I was responsible for everything from email organization to interviews to event arrangement. The restaurant Fat Rice had its own compelling story. Co-owned by one part Portuguese man and one half Chinese woman, the restaurant specialized in the food of Macau, a former Portuguese colony off the coast of China, representing the background and the blending of the life and business, the life of the business partners who had founded the restaurant. At the time, Fat Rice had just been featured as the fourth best new restaurant in the country, and maintaining this hype was essential to the success of the business. 
Both owners worked no less than 12 hours a day, seven days a week, ordering, managing, cooking, and putting out the various proverbial fires inherent to restaurant ownership. As with most chef owners, Chef Conlon was accustomed to having absolute control over his operation, a space in which he was the expert and the creative mastermind. And where time and money were tight, this left little time to engage with computerized technologies, and the chef's lack of expertise often left him unaware of or frustrated with much of new media. Over the course of several months, I found that instead of crafting the restaurant's story, Chef Conlon, like many of his contemporaries, fell into new media's commands of him rather than the other way around. This included appearances on morning television, at cooking competitions, and other events sponsored and promoted by outside agencies. We were fed prepackaged tweets and posts, which were to be copied and pasted according to suggested timelines via the restaurant's generic account. This is to say that the personal element waned in the media, especially any information coming directly from the chef himself. According to my field work, this happens for several reasons, including the chef's perception of social media as a necessary evil that the most respected chefs just don't give a fuck about, the lack of mastery with the interfaces required to express their creativity through media, and the time required to become proficient in and keep up with new media's immediate and evolving nature. Now moving on to my third feel site, which was the app and platform production. Um, this felt lacuna in the chef world for the personal and authentic stories behind chefing, popularized by Anthony Bourdain, among others, was recognized by PR consultant Ellen Malloy, who had worked under one of the most popular restaurant groups in Chicago before starting her own company, which after years of refining, was awarded almost a million dollar seed funding to begin development on their app, which was designed to open the world of chef's stories. Initially, Morsel consisted of Ellen, the company's founder, an appointed CEO, and three software developers. While software experience was essential to app development, access to restaurant kitchens, small, busy, and exclusive spaces was equally essential for the company's success in content acquisition. My experience in restaurant kitchens, working for some hot-headed chefs, combined with Ellen's access to the entire chef community, led me to a position as the at this startup as content curator. Over about eight months, I traveled throughout the city, thanks, um, visiting kitchens, bars, and special events, documenting the stories behind dishes and beverages created by cooks, chefs, bartenders, butchers, and the like. In this last field site, I experienced the everyday networks of production and the factors influencing multi-directional transformations of food, story, and media. Board meetings consisted of lengthy discussions about the app as technological tool built by producers who had never set foot in a kitchen. My job required that I extract inspiration and personal anecdotes as quickly and efficiently as possible from people whose lives I had already documented as consisting of zero downtime. While I buffed up stories for multiple daily publications, the majority of chefs usually had one of three things to say about their most recent production. This amounted to about such, that they had created a dish to one, use up an ingredient, two, because the ingredient was cheap, or three, just because. This is to say that for a creator whose daily job it is to put out anywhere from five to 100 of a particular dish and change menus daily, weekly, or seasonally, the stories lying behind their dishes are rarely as thought through as those assembled for a three minute documentary on appetite. Instead, skills of articulation are put directly into the sense of taste, not text. In conclusion, fieldwork across the networks of food and media production revealed several spaces of friction created by technologies linking together separate spheres of production, which I found also illuminated larger issues inherent to life as a prosumer in a new media world. First, that our desire for authenticity is often in stark juxtaposition with reality, in many cases, we prefer a distilled and mediated story that conjures rather than reflects authenticity. That is, we seek an authenticity that fits into our contemporary consumption models, fragmented, immediate, and entertaining. Second, that food producers, while given the tools to mediate themselves and requiring those tools for their own success, do not trust, respect, or have time to become proficient with these technologies, which they perceive as inauthentic as a whole. And third, that the more proficiently executed and seemingly authentic our stories become, the farther removed from reality they sometimes are. 
in some keeping a keen eye, ear, and tongue on these background processes that are made to attract and interact with us, and considering at what cost such entertainment comes is essential to understanding what and why we as prosumers are creating and consuming. By paying attention to the possibility that the hegemony of aesthetic taste may subvert our experience of the physiological one, we are better equipped to match our expectations with our goals. Whether it is on our plate or in our newsfeed, such investigation is essential to co-creating the mediated world in which we want to live. Thank you. Okay, next, um, we're gonna skip over Amir's quickly, just in case we can catch up on a little bit of time, um, and move on to Amanda Sophie Green's paper, which is Chefs as Cultural Bearers and Innovators in the Production of Sami Cuisines. I'll go ahead and get started. Um, my name's Amanda Green. I'm part of the Applied Anthropology Program at Oregon State University. I want to begin with a moment recorded in my field notes. In June of 2014, I sat at a table with 10 other food activists and chefs in Jokmok, Sweden, a small town just above the Arctic Circle. We were there at the invitation of Eldrimer, Sweden's National Artisanal Food Production Center, with the goal of discussing and tasting traditional foods and recipes from this area of northern Sweden. And, as Eldrimner's director put it, quote, to record this knowledge and figure out ways to build businesses and make money from it. Those of you in the audience will likely recognize this now classic anthropological observation described best by Komarov and Komarov in their 2009 book, Ethnicity, Inc. It is the present focus on the objectification and marketing of all things related to heritage, including cuisine, in order to make money or to make a living. During this meeting Eld with the Eldrimer, Dreamner, a leader in slow food Sapni, reflected on the recent and similar work of Sami food organizers in the making of their new cookbook, Smak po Sapni, Taste Sapni. Sapni here refers to the land of the Sami peoples across northern Europe, um, northern Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Russia. Uh, okay, these are pictures from the meeting. In the gathering together of a professional food photographer, knowledgeable food elders, journalists, food activists, and chefs, they realized suddenly that, oh, we're beginning to define Sami food. Across the globe, people are working to document and in most cases commodify heritage cuisines. Possibilities to engage in these projects in Sweden are numerous, from designing Sami cookbooks, competing to be the best Sami chef, pictured here, to documenting Sami food traditions. Such projects inevitably enlist chefs with Sami backgrounds in their work to document, revive, and sometimes market particular culinary traditions. But Sami chefs, and likely most indigenous chefs, commodify culinary heritage not just to make a living. This work, for most of them, is also to maintain and honor family and traditional knowledges and to maintain Sami places on the land. The goal of this paper is to document the roles of contemporary chefs who identify as Sami or are identified as Sami in crafting Sami cuisines. I seek to add ethnographic material to this growing discussion on the roles of chefs in contemporary culinary worlds. Today I focus on three facets I believe makes the work of Sami chefs and their roles in crafting cuisines unique. The first is that chefs who identify as Sami must represent and work as more than chefs. The second is that chefs participate with discomfort in the narrowing and, object and object objectification of Sami cuisines. And the third is that the chefs often refuse to define Sami cuisines in simple ways. This paper is part of my larger dissertation project that describes the ways new food movements are intersecting with Sami political activism, describing the emerging discourses, practices, and livelihoods that are made possible in the coming together of these two trajectories. I have been conducting ethnographic fieldwork on Sami food activism since 2008, and the bulk of my dissertation research took place from 2013 to 2014 in Jokmok, when the Swedish government nominated it as Sweden's 2014 culinary capital. I define the, ter the term chef loosely to include all those who work with or have worked in restaurants and kitchens. For this paper, I use interviews with nine chefs who identify as Sami, and I pull from media coverage of four other chefs from the years 2009 to the present. I also ate at their restaurants, participated and observed in kitchens where I could, attended food workshops they held, and was part of several meetings to discuss the documentation and development of Sami foods. 
Sami identity and Sami rights to land and culture stem largely from the powerful image of Sami individuals as reindeer herders. Much Sami political activism works towards the preservation and enablement of this lifestyle, the charismatic image of the herder and their reindeer as pictured here. The work of food activism is similar. Sami food organizers are primarily focused on, the increasing, on increasing the sale and value of reindeer meat so that reindeer herding can continue to be a viable industry for Sami peoples in Sweden. Chefs are equally bound up in this project where they must work as more than chefs. They are bound up as food activists because once they identify as Sami chefs, they are working to continue a culinary tradition as well as working to maintain access to Sami lands and cultural resources. It is hoped that by selling Sami cuisines based on reindeer meat, they enable more people to remain in the North working as herders. And by building international interest in Sami cuisines, they popularize a small niche Sami industry for Sami individuals to make a living as chefs, sous chefs, servers, and food tourism organizers. At an organizational meeting for the National Food Conference held in Yokmok in 2014, one Sami food innovator made this hope clear when she stated, if they see how special it is up here, maybe the young people will stay. The importance of chefs to the maintenance of reindeer herding can also be more con concrete. Most chefs have family that are reindeer herders or butchers, and they might buy the meat from them. They or their partners may be butchers and herders themselves, as in the case of Andre, who can sell more of the meat from his wife's reindeer because he is also a chef and can tell people the ways to prepare it. Though chefs prepare and serve Sami cuisines, there is an ambiguity and refusal to fully define Sami foods. Scholar Christina Orian describes a hyper-reflexivity on the part of Sami food entrepreneurs, an awareness of what has been written about the Sami by others, like myself, and how that knowledge can be objectifying and useful for marketing Sami foods. I would further add that there is an element of refusal to participate in the object objectification of their own culture, a facet which I experienced as a researcher. For example, I often asked chefs and food innovators how they defined Sami foods. Many responded by refusing to call what they produce Sami or by posing the question back to me, as in these exchanges. I tell Thomas that I'm interested in studying Sami food traditions and the people that are working to promote Sami foods. I'm actually interested in talking with people like him who run businesses selling meat. He says, well, what I do is not Sami food. We do Swedish food. We're making reindeer meat for a Swedish market. We are experimenting with different products and ways to use the meat, and we make only some traditional food. In another exchange with a chef, I ask her, and what about the expectation that you're serving Sami food? What does that mean to you? She responds, Sami food? Well, what does it mean to you? I responded, I don't know. It can mean so many different things. That's why I asked you. She continued, Sami food is so amazingly big. I mean, we have suavas a la carte for people who want more traditional foods. Dot, dot, dot. I don't know what people expect with Sami food. That's the quote you've been reading. The aspect that most chefs appear to agree on, and most people representing those chefs in print media, is that Sami food means holism, or using everything from an animal and using ingredients from the local region. Reindeer, moose, ptarmigan, fish like arctic char, brown trout, whitefish, and perch. Elaine Ask, probably the most well-known chef preparing Sami foods, told a reporter who happened across her drying reindeer hides following the slaughter, it's common sense that you use the whole animal. Laila Speak, a chef and cultural representative for many years, tells a reporter that taking advantage of everything was the way of cooking, using, for example, the skin, head, heart, liver, and blood of a fish. That is how one chef can prepare cloud, smoked cloudberries for his dessert, while the chef at the Sami Elementary School can prepare tacos and pizza using ground reindeer and moose meat. It's why another cultural representative can smile and tell a reporter that pizza is an old Sami food, using the Sami flatbread with reindeer fat, reindeer tongue, and sausage. These examples demonstrate there is a flexibility in what can count as Sami foods, but chefs also work with own awareness of the implications of defining the boundaries of this food. The concept of Sami food is not new, but it has never received as much attention as in the present. In 2009, Sami traditional food specialist and chef Greta Huva was selected by Sweden's Rural Ministry as the Sami food ambassador. During a Sami food conference, she stated, quote, Sami food got a face when I became the food ambassador. Journalists want to talk to me. Sometimes I feel too much because there are more, than more out there than just me. Ten years ago, Sami food didn't exist in society. It's been in our kitchens. Sami chefs are figuring out what exactly their role is in producing these foods. As one chef reported, he and chefs like Greta Huva are not trying to be gurus. Rather, they're trying to get Sami food out to the public. 
Huva and other Sami chefs are uncomfortable with their participation in the objectification of themselves and their foodways. However, they are also bound by the sense that they must document the food traditions because they either risk losing them or they risk someone else making money from their knowledge. Such processes have already occurred, for example, with the traditional reindeer, Sami reindeer suavas, pictured here, a smoked and salted reindeer meat made popular in Sweden by the work of Slow Food Sweden and Slow Food Safni. It is now produced by large slaughterhouses, which are accused of co-opting Sami knowledge because they have no Sami cultural roots. To document and transfer this culinary knowledge, Huva and other food activists and chefs have worked actively to start a Sami culinary program in Jokmok. Huva believes that Sami knowledge is transferred from grandparent to grandchild, but this mechanism is broken today because children live far from their grandparents. Younger Sami need new ways to learn the knowledge she gained as a child from her grandparents. Approximately half the chefs I interviewed received their culinary training in Sweden's high school system, while the other half learned from their parents or grandparents and learned to cook in restaurants on the job. Unsurprisingly, the younger chefs are those who learned, to, learned in high school, while the older chefs learned on the job and from grandparents. Then a mechanism to transfer what are considered traditional ways of preparation breaks down for the most part from the generation of 40 years old and younger. Huva and chefs of her generation that are trained like herself by their grandparents recognize that not all Sami have the same traditions. You go from the knowledge you have yourself. Huva also reasons they need a Sami culinary training because we don't get knowledge the same way today and you need other knowledge to run a restaurant. The shift from localized and embodied knowledge to school-based and codified knowledge will of course change Sami culinary practices today and in the future. Thus, chefs feel that they must work with traditional foods, and they do, pictured here is Greta Huva, but they do this work with the knowledge that taking these steps may change the essence of what they're working with. Huva warned in 2014 that, quote, Sami has an exotic sound, and the risk is that traditional recipes will be modernized into something unrecognizable without a knowledge base. The Sami are being exploited again. Two women have taken over the Sami culinary training program from Huva, and they often face the question whether students should be producing and consuming traditionally prepared or more modern Sami delicacies. For example, in making the well-known Sami bread called gaku, the new instructors chose to use a sourdough base, organic wheat, rye flowers, and real vegetable oil rather than white flour and margarine. The instructor knew she was being non-traditional, but she wanted to be healthy and stay with the trends. She also wanted to make something that her grandchild was permitted to eat by her mother. In the efforts of food innovators to build competence in Sami cuisine, or as one person stated, more Sami people working with Sami food, there is a push-pull relationship between learning traditional ways of food pre preparation, updating those ways to meet today's interests, and learning skills for the restaurant trade. As one person put it, are chefs to learn traditional techniques or food sanitation? What's more important? Chefs and their instructors sit at this uncomfortable juncture deciding what Sami foods to teach students and prepare for the public. Those chefs may agree that Sami cuisines are good as they are. They of course must still respond to customer interests, their expect expectations of foodies. In the North, there's the assumption that tourists want one type of food, as one chef stated, after you've done it for so many years, you know what people are ex expect to eat when they come up here. It's cloud berries, reindeer, and arctic char. If you do these three, you've got everything. While this may have been true a few years ago, I heard criticism of the food served in Jokmok's restaurants many times. The meal of reindeer, cloud berries, and arctic char is formulaic to them. These food visiting foodies want the exotic. Tongue, heart, intestines, berries prepared in a new way, unusual parts of the fish, lichens, some chefs have responded to this interest, while others stick with the above-mentioned formula. Chef Martin Janssen has chosen to respond to that interest. He tells a reporter that his goal is to cook traditional food in a way that no one has seen. He serves dessert in marrow bones, eggs in bird feeders, reindeer blood in a taco shell, chocolate that is smoked and salted. He states that while top round and fillets are for tourists, he wants to make a reindeer stew for a king or president. Quote, at home, everything is in the same pot. But if I, made that, if I made that for my guests, they would turn around and leave. But I can cook it up in seven courses and make it into an experience. In conclusion, I've been thinking about the limitations that identity places on these chefs. As of now, none of these chefs have reached the star magnitude of the new Nordic producers like Magnus Nielsen at Faviken or Rene Redzepi at Noma. Yet these star chefs are using the ingredients 
and sometimes the knowledge of Sami foodways. In one case, I learned that a chef I interviewed actually harvested and ground the pine bark and lichens for these restaurants. Chefs who identify as Sami seek to innovate like other new Nordic che chefs, um, preparing cloudberries, chocolate, and carrots smoked with birch as representations of Sami cuisines. At the same time, via their identification as Sami, they are equally bound up to Sami political projects which may limit their innovation. They are, part <laughs> they are part of documenting Sami culinary heritage with organizations like Eldrimner and Slow Food. They are part of building an industry of Sami-owned food experiences, and their valorization and marketing of reindeer meat may help herders on the land. Chefs work with an awareness of their uncomfortable pos position as innovators and preservers of Sami cuisines. And we tend to ask more from them to be innovative and traditional, to be fantastic like celebrity chefs, and to be conservative like other bearers of culture. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. We're gonna move on to our last presenter who is John Nihu, and he is from the University of Connecticut. His paper is titled, Dan Barber and the Lost Flavor of Wheat. Gastronomy's prominent assumption in popular culture has caused chefs to realize that it is no longer enough for them to roll out their own pasta or even bake their own bread. In the pursuit of perfection, they have recently taken their obsessive quest for flavor one step further by turning to freshly milled whole wheat flour. While this may seem unworthy of being, quote, on some exciting culinary frontier, end quote, consider that globally, an estimated four and a half billion people eat some form of the staple crop every day. In the US, these amber waves of grain cover 15% of all farmland, a number which puts to shame the mere 3% of land devoted to fruits and vegetables. Despite its smaller size, this 3% produces the items most coveted by consumers at farmer's market. Yet, when it comes to wheat, quote, we have somehow convinced ourselves that it is okay to cook and bake with what is essentially rotten produce, end quote. Not only is most of the wheat basically dead because of the extensive bleaching process it undergoes to render it shelf stable, but the same modern varieties of nameless and homogenous wheat are grown in nutrient-starved soils, thereby requiring the addition of chemical fertilizers and unreasonable amounts of water to help them grow, demonstrating that the entire system is inherently unsustainable. From a flavor standpoint, Chef Dan, Barber's, Chef Dan Barber compares cooking with such wheat to, quote, trying to build a delicious menu around these ingredients, end quote. It seems that as society has steadily grown more distant from its food supply, it has become apathetic to food's taste and traditions, and is now simply viewing food as fuel, something Barber believes to be, quote, a dangerous concept, but that's where we are right now, food as fuel. It's why nothing tastes good and why our farm systems are collapsing, end quote. And the growing of wheat reflects this, whereas it was once bred for flavor, it is now solely bred for efficiency and convenience. Barber executive chef of the critically acclaimed Blue Hill at Stone Barns restaurant in New York's Hudson Valley, has devoted much of his culinary expertise to reclaiming the lost flavor of wheat. He is not a typical chef, as his restaurant is part of an 80-acre working farm known as the Stone Barns Center for Food and Agriculture, which grows over 200 varieties of produce year-round and is home to an array of pastured animals. Such a closed system has given Barber near complete control of his restaurant's food supply and has earned him numerous accolades and awards, allowing him to become one of the world's most influential chefs. His fame has provided him with the platform to speak at several TED Talks and other symposia, earn James Beard awards and a spot on the San Pellegrino list, his own episode of Netflix's Chef's Table, and the opportunity to publish the third plate, Field Notes on the Future of Food. In this manifesto, Barber encourages farmers to grow delicious and nutritious varieties of wheat, which promote healthy soil and sustainable farming practices. He sees the mere growing of this crop as a path to revitalizing local mills and bakeries, demonstrating that an ingredient as simple as a grain can influence meaningful change. Barbara's interest in wheat made sense given its prevalence in most kitchens, but it was a sudden realization of its poor quality that motivated him to tackle the problem. In viewing chefs as advocates for flavor, he believes that they, quote, have an opportunity and perhaps the responsibility to use their cooking to shape culture, to manifest what's possible, and in doing so, to inspire a new ethic of eating, end quote. 
Barber considers chefs to be ambassadors for change who possess the ability to reshape the food landscape and redefine appetites from the ground up, not just by changing, or pardon me, not just by inspiring consumers to try new varieties of produce, but by changing the way in which they are grown. This presentation will discuss Chef Barber and his own variety of wheat and the impact his grain revival has had on altering local food cultures. By using his celebrity status as a chef to encourage small farms and bakeries to prioritize flavor, Barber has shown he possesses the means to influence dietary changes while simultaneously educating his clientele and supporters about nutrition, ecology, culture, and most importantly, flavorful foods. For the last 9,000 years, wheat has been a staple crop for many cultures, not only for the value of the grain itself, but also for its straw, which could be used as thatch, fodder, fuel, bedding, among other possibilities. It was, quote, a community builder, a grain whose benefits were reaped only through cooperation and effective social organization. Farmers grew it, millers ground it, and bakers turned it into sustenance and pleasure, end quote. Farmers consistently pro produced delicious wheat by saving seeds that would be used in subsequent sowings, as these seeds had already proven to be well adapted to their local climates with good pest resistance and great flavor. Furthermore, by growing it within a care careful crop rotation system that was ecologically sensible and beneficial, it would, quote, disrupt disease cycles and return nutrients to the so soil, end quote, ultimately producing more nutrient-rich plants and providing the opportunity to plant a wider variety of crops. The millers then ground the wheat kernels whole, utilizing all three of the grain's main components, quote, a fibrous and nutrient-rich outer coating called the bran, the flavorful and aromatic germ, and a pouch of starch known as the endosperm, end quote, all of which was mashed together during grinding, thereby preserving its nutritional content while simultaneously creating a broad spectrum of complex flavors and aromas that were unique to each crop, allowing bakers to create exquisite breads. However, once industrial farming took over, many of these heirloom or land race varietals disappeared as companies became better equipped to more efficiently and cheaply process grain. Now, farmers are, quote, producing grain strictly as commodity with no more cultural heritage attached to it, end quote. And consumers have since become accustomed to wheat that produces, quote, nutrient-poor flour and insipid, spongy breads, end quote. Two stories ultimately contributed to the death of land race wheat and had disastrous implications for its flavor, one being a scientist's desire to feed the world and the other being the industrialization of grain mills. In the late 1950s, parts of the world faced massive starvation and a scientist by the name of Dr. Norman Borlaug believed this needed fixing. Seeing that the global market was desperate for grain, he encouraged firm farmers to, quote, plant wall-to-wall -wall harvests of wheat, end quote. This large-scale shift to the monoculturization of farming had horrible consequences for the local ecology, as a valuable system of crop rotations was abandoned, much of the soil was quickly denuded. To address this problem, Borla created a cocktail of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium to feed the plants their most basic foods. Essentially, he was bypassing the entire periodic table, end quote, substituting a few soluble elements for an entire living system, end quote. A mentality Barbara likens to, quote, thinking that an intravenous needle can administer a delicious meal, end quote. Borla's steroids ultimately caused wheat stalks to shoot up with heavy seed heads, and because without the requisite time and array of nutrients to grow into healthy and mature plants, the stalks were not strong enough to hold the heavy heads and the plants kept falling over, making harvest next to impossible. To fix his latest dilemma, Borla created a semi-dwarf variety that had good resistance to pests and disease and had such enormous yields that harvest nearly tripled in size within 10 years. Undoubtedly, this quote, altered the way we grow food on a large scale, as the world is now awash in monocultures of genetically uniform varieties fed by chemical fertilizers, end quote. But even if Borla had managed to grow tasty wheat, industrial milling practices would have ensured its demise. Now that wheat for flour could be quickly and cheaply grown, large food companies were quick to adopt better technology that essentially turned their factors into, quote, abattoirs for wheat, end quote. Here, a process using roller mills rolls the outer bran layer off the kernel, removes the germ, and grinds the remaining endosperm into white flour, which then undergoes a kilning process to dry it out and prevent spoilage. It is worth noting that even if heritage varieties had remained popular, they would not have conformed to the characteristics required for industrial milling, meaning that farmers who still grow land race wheat as part of their crop rotations do so at a financial loss. As there is no market for their non-uniform grain, they can only sell it as cheap cattle feed or plow it back into the field. The result of this industrial quote unquote mummification process strips most of the flavor from wheat and allows companies to quote, 
create ultra-processed refined flour that is drop-dead consistent for baking and totally stable for storage and distribution, end quote. While the uniformity of such flour is, admit is admittedly useful for commercial bakeries and restaurants, it means that only 6% of all flour produced in the U.S. is truly whole wheat, a sad figure given how much of it is used every day. As a means of recuperating much of the social, cultural, nutritive, and flavorful aspects of what used to be associated with wheat, Barber set out on a crusade to resurrect and restore its terroir and introduce his diners to, quote, the idea of wheat having taste and flavor, end quote, a foreign concept to many. Barber's mission was simple. He only wanted to track down old and delicious varietals, which proved more difficult than he had anticipated as Borlaug, Borla's variety had successfully conquered much of the globe. It was not until a trip to a small town in Spain that he discovered a variety of wheat known as Aragon III, which was of such high quality that the town refused to grow anything else, because over the years it had developed good resistance to pests, provided good yields, and had an outstanding flavor. Barber brought some kernels back to his farm for planting, where he realized that, quote, heirloom foods may be what we think of as the gold standard, grown before the era of industrial agriculture, but they're frozen in time and thus frequently unsuited to current soil and climate conditions, end quote. So much effort had gone into finding this land race wheat that Barber forgot to consider that his Spanish varietal might be unfit for the Hudson Valley's climate. In order to address this issue, Barber contacted Dr. Steve Jones, seen here on the bottom left, head of the now famous bread lab at Washington State University, a research center renowned for its devotion of taking old world techniques and marrying them with modern technology to breed new artisanal varieties of land race wheat. Barber challenged Jones to, quote, breed a delicious wheat that was nutritious, that had good yield for the farmer, and that had good pest resistance, end quote. Jones immediately accepted and decided to breed Aragon III with, quote, another variety to accentuate its characteristics and then make it better by marrying it to another local variety to ensure that those genetics carry on into the future, end quote. Ultimately creating what is now called Barber wheat, a varietal perfectly adapted to the ecology and climate surrounding Blue Hill that still preserve the original characteristics of Aragon III. Barber mainly uses the flour from his wheat, milled in house, to bake into bread such as this one, which proves to be a pure way of allowing the wheat's complex flavors and aromas to express themselves. And after having had the opportunity to taste some of it, I can tell you that it makes a mockery of the stuff that permeates our supermarket shelves. Barber's bread was utterly delicious and proves that wheat has as much potential for flavor as a tomato. Apart from the bread, Barber wheat is also used in many pastries and other baked goods that are sold at Blue Hill's newly created grain bar, a separate venue that Barber hopes will serve as an example for how the artisanal wheat industry can revitalize local communities. He believes that the key to this system is to start from the ground up, literally with the soil where the driver for flavor lies. So he, quote, encouraged farmers to improve their soil by creating a market for grains that added fertility. Since without a buyer, farmers can't justify planting them into rotations, and without planting them into the rotations, sooner or later, soil fertility declines, end quote. Not only does this promote sustainable farming practices, but with a new market for their product, farmers can actually turn a profit. To do all this, Barber had to restructure the local supply and distribution network, starting with the farmers, who first had to be persuaded to grow the crop. Quote, but in order to persuade them, Barber had to convince the bakers that they needed better wheat, end quote which required getting millers to purchase the heirloom grain and turn it into a product that is then sold to chefs and bakers, who are then entrusted to create something delicious with it. This last part is essential, for as Barbara rightly points out, quote, none of this will matter if it isn't tethered to cuisine, end quote. Since the food chain is such that end users will dictate what they want to purchase from the flour manufacturers, who in turn will tell their mills, and who in turn will tell their farmers. And this is where Barbara's philosophy as the, as philosophy of the chef as ambassador of change comes brilliantly into play, as he hopes that chefs will use and their use of such products will trickle down and influence others to follow in their stead. While there is reason to be skeptical of such trickle-down policies, the success of the partnership between Barber and the Bread Lab has inspired one of the country's largest fast casual chains to change its own practices. After a conversation with Barber and Jones, Chipotle's founder, Steve Ells, approached the Bread Lab to inquire about the possibility of a collaboration to, quote, use regional wheats in its tortillas, end quote. While there are certainly issues of scale, considering that Chipotle uses nearly 800,000 tortillas a day, and that switching over to inconsistent regionally-based wheats would mean that its tortillas across the country would vary in flavor, it would represent a significant shift in the status quo. And while access to such grains are, quote, 
still quite sealed off for most of American society, end quote, a true testament to industrial wheat's ability to have so thoroughly obliterated its competition, if the partnership between the Bread Lab and Chipotle succeeds, quote, it will bring real whole wheat to more American plates than any other Bread Lab collab collaboration so far, end quote, and will do so at a national level. Admittedly, Barber's distant utopic system faces numerous obstacles, but this first of its kind, partner of its kind partnership shows promise. Since the late 1950s, industrial agriculture has been selectively breeding large monoculture harvests of wheat for uniformity, high yields, and overall resistance to drought and disease, essentially breeding for efficiency and convenience rather than taste. As Barber aims to reverse this by prioritizing flavor, the chef is effectively making use of his celebrity status to help reclaim the lost flavor of wheat. And while such heirloom wheats will never replace their industrial counterpart, just think if what would happen if a mere 5% of those 47 million acres were switched to land race wheats. It could benefit both the environment and our enjoyment of food. Thank you. Thank you, John. It looks like we have enough time left to listen to Amir's um, excellent video. This is coming from Iran, I believe. So his talk is called um, The Role of Iranian Chefs in Changing Perception of Persian Cuisine. Hello, everybody. Um, I am Amir, and Sam is behind the camera, and uh, we are here today. Um, I mean, we are not there, we are here. Uh, we really wanted to be there, but it seems that um, getting a visa from the U.S. would take 8 to 12 months for those who were born in Iran, according to the U.S. Embassy. Uh, so, uh, we were not fortunate enough to be there with you, um, or probably not fortunate enough to be born somewhere else, so that getting a visa wouldn't take a year. Um, anyway, um, thanks for uh, having us, and thanks to uh, Greg, who allowed us to record our presentation and send it to you. Uh, though, uh, on the positive side, um, since uh, we are recording this, uh, we will be presenting precisely for 15 minutes, so the chair of the session could just lay back and not to worry about the timing or pointing us when the time is up, um, because we can see you, obviously. Uh, but again, uh, we will promise that we will be done by uh, 15 minutes. <clears throat> um, so, um, our paper, uh, just like the uh, other papers in this panel, is about uh, the chefs and their roles uh, in changing the cuisines. Um, but our paper particularly focuses on um, Iranian chefs and their role in uh, changing the perception, or at least trying to change the perception of uh, Persian cuisine. <clears throat> uh, we um, thought uh, one of the best ways to uh, explore this is to look into the cookbooks written by these chefs. And when we say chefs, we don't mean those in Iran, because uh, that's another story, and they are writing for a different kind of audience in Iran, and also there is no need to introduce the uh, Persian cuisine or to change the perception of Persian cuisine in Iran, because um, everybody already, uh, already knows about that, and uh, they, they grew up with it, so there is no point. Um, rather, we are talking about the chefs um, based abroad, and uh, these people are the people who have uh, left the country, probably for good, after the Islamic Revolution in uh, 1979 and migrated to uh, Europe and to the US, uh, or they are the second generation Iranians who are uh, in fact the children of those who left the country in 1979. <clears throat> but um, before uh, going into depth, I would like to um, give a, a brief introduction on uh, three main categories of Iranian cookbooks. Uh, because uh, we think that uh, clarifying these different types of cookbooks could um, give a better general idea of uh, what and um, how Iranian cookbooks are. Um, <clears throat> well, the first group of um, Iranian cookbooks are 
um, early Persian cookbooks, uh, which are the cooking manuscripts uh, written as far as uh, 500 years ago. Um, these types of cookbooks usually aim the professional chefs, um, usually the ones from the uh, royal court, and um, therefore their recipes are uh, for the um, elite and aristocrats who were mostly living in large households. Um, unlike um, you know, many other types of cookbooks, housewives are not at all the target readers of these cookbooks because um, housewives uh, had their very own um, gender-specific methods of um, transmitting recipes among themselves, both um, horizontally within generation as well as from one generation uh, to the next. So recipes in these cookbooks are uh, not representative of uh, what normal people in that time would eat. Um, the second group of uh, cookbooks are um, modern Persian cookbooks. Um, well, the, the first of these kind um, was written around 1920, which inspired all the cookbooks after that. Uh, these books are uh, usually dedicated to Iranian women and housewives, uh, unlike the previous group, uh, to teach them the modern methods of um, housekeeping or um, the principles of hygiene, or, uh, as well as the cooking, Iranian and Western dishes, especially French dishes. Um, the recipes in this group of uh, cookbooks can be divided in uh, two main sections. Uh, the first one is um, Iranian food and the second one is Western foods. Um, but the interesting thing is that the attention to the Western food and the pages uh, dedicated to the Western cuisine um, and Western party hosting in many cases exceeded the chapters and pages on Iranian food. Uh, but even more interesting is that uh, at the time that these cookbooks were mostly published, it was uh, very, very unusual for women and for uh, housewives to do their uh, daily cooking according to cookbooks um, instead of uh, following traditional uh, instructions received from uh, their mothers or, uh, for example, their grandmothers. Um, even more unusual was uh, making a non-Iranian dish at home. Um, at, at that time, there was a clear, a clear preference for Iranian food at home, and the use of uh, Western food was limited to a few European-style restaurants or a limited type of dishes, such as uh, shenitzel or uh, beef estragano. Uh, so these recipes, such as, uh, for example, pork jelly or any um, other savory jelly, they're almost uh, never tried by those who bought these cookbooks. And uh, when you look at those recipes now, uh, you will realize that uh, most of them are entirely based on uh, fantasy and they have nothing to do uh, with how the real dish uh, should be. Um, and um, this fictional conception in cookbook writing of that time could be uh, because of a strong interest in Western cuisine. Um, in fact, it's not about preparing the dishes, but rather uh, talking about it without having any practical effect at all. Um, <clears throat> but the um, third group of uh, Iranian cookbooks uh, are what uh, Bert Fragner, the famous Iranologist, uh, calls ethnographic cookbooks. Um, ethnographic cookbooks are the cookbooks that uh, we have focused on in our study. And these cookbooks are kind of opposite uh, to the second group that we just introduced. Um, the second group intended to um, brag about uh, the Western cuisine within the Iranian border, while the third group is um, intending to introduce and uh, explain the characters and highlights of the Iranian cuisine to Westerners. And uh, that means, of course, they are written in Western languages and mostly in English. Um, as far as we know, and as far as we could find, um, there are 20 cookbooks of this kind published, and uh, we were able to reach all of them, and to examine them closely using a mixed method of uh, content analysis. Um, most of these cookbooks have, um, as I told you earlier, um, an ethnographic character. Uh, that means the intention of uh, their authors is to present a homogeneous culture through the perspective of the cookbook genre. 
Um, most of these books are written by uh, authors who have uh, left the country uh, probably for good after the 1979 um, Islamic Revolution in Iran. And it seems that um, these authors are uh, trying to maintain um, some strong ties with their ancestral culture. Uh, for example, uh, Najmiya Batmavidic is the author of six of these cookbooks and all her cookbooks uh, present and idealize an historical picture of Iranian culture and create the um, image of an unbroken continuity of um, Iranian civilization. Um, the recipes in most of these cookbooks have almost um, nothing to do with culinary reality, I mean nothing. Um, I remember that uh, Sam and I uh, once um, gave a try to a few of these recipes to see uh, how um, authentic, authentic they test, taste. Um, we did exactly as the recipe said and we followed the instructions as accurately as possible. Um, then we thought that we could invite over a, a group of Iranians in Norway, which we did. And um, th these people, they were from different backgrounds and different cities in Iran. Um, some of them were living in um, Norway for more than 30 years and some others were just newcomers. Um, but the interesting point was that not even one of them agreed on those dishes being authentic Iranian, or at least what they grew up with in their households, or uh, what their mm, mothers or grandmothers cooked. <clears throat> so what I'm saying is that these cookbooks seem to try to um, create a national culture, a, a national cuisine, and tell us about people's um, collective imaginations or uh, symbolic values, dreams and expectations, uh, rather than about just culinary conditions. We know that uh, the fact that a recipe shows up in a cookbook does not necessarily mean that people eat that dish. Conversely, is it, it is not true that people do not eat a dish which has not appeared in a cookbook. Um, I mean, recipes in these cookbooks um, uh, have a nationalistic tone. Um, they, are, they are either the ones which others think Iranians should eat or what they want others think that Iranians would eat. Um, these cookbooks, we think, uh, promote a um, kind of romanticized pre-Islamic uh, national construction by evoking an authentic authenticity and superiority of Persian cooking from ancient times. Uh, most of these books claim um, much of the Middle Eastern Asian repertoire uh, to be of Persian uh, origin. So, in this way, food um, has become one of the main aspects of presenting the Persian culture and uh, some dishes began to be recognized as um, originally Persian dishes which have traveled through the borders and has inspired um, Greeks or uh, Turkish and even Mediterranean cuisine. Um, and in some other cases, however, these national dishes are not even Iranian by core and they're previously found or uh, consumed in other countries and cultures. Uh, they were only borrowed from others. So basically and loosely uh, what these cookbooks say is that uh, Iranian or Persian cuisine uh, was the key cuisine of that area and the route to which other cuisines belong to. And if you, if you find a non-Iranian item in, this, in these books, it was enriched with uh, Iranian food waste, if you will. Um, to wrap it up, um, national identity in the cookbooks that we examine can be observed within the pages of Persian cookbooks. Uh, emphasis on Persia and Persian uh, seem not to be a simple state of a place or a simple state of a nationality. Uh, rather, they seem to emphasize on uh, Persianness, if you will. Uh, the notion of Persian culture is clearly present in these cookbooks, and we think um, this is because Iranians who uh, formerly were stereotyped in the West for being sophisticated or intelligent or, I don't know, wealthy, have latterly been undermined by potent Islamophobia and racism. The Islamic Revolution had a great impact not only on people in Iran, but on Iranians all over the world. Um, the revolution um, actually transformed the perceptions of the people in Western countries as a result of uh, international media, of course. Um, so, um, before this, Iranians were 
uh, often portrayed uh, to be progressive or to be wealthy uh, or intelligent. But after the revolution, they were kind of um, redefined. Um, so after that, Iran was perceived once more as a third world nation and its people were thought to be uh, illiterate peasants or, um, I don't know, religious fundamentalists. Uh, so we propose that what these authors are trying to do within the pages of um, some best-selling cookbooks might be an effort to transform this imposed stereotype of Iran and its uh, Islamic revolution and turn it into a more acceptable image for the Western audience. And um, when I'm saying a more acceptable image, I um, don't mean only food and the cuisine, but also an acceptable image about its culture, about its people, uh, and um, about the, I don't know, 2,500 year civilization history. And in order to do that, they use food as a defensive strategy to alienate themselves uh, from their uh, stereotyped identity. Uh, they even avoid using the name Iran and Iranian in the books. Instead, they use um, Persia and Persian, which is the ancient name of Iran, uh, because Persia gives that pre-Islamic cool and exotic image of Iran to the readers as the home of Persian cat or Persian rod. Well, the name of Iran, thanks to media, is associated with um, Islamic prejudice and um, other unpleasant political matters. And these others are trying, to, uh, trying their best to stay away from that as much as possible uh, within the pages of their cookbooks. Um, so, I think we are reaching our limit, our 15 um, minute limit. So, I just finished this with uh, thanking you all for listening to us and hope to see you again in the near future. Uh, so, thank you again. Well, thanks, Mir. Um, thank you all for. Um attending this session. We're going to start with a conversation um, from our discussant, Greg de Saint-Maurice from the University of Pittsburgh. Um, if you don't already have it marked in your schedule, uh, I encourage you to attend his session tomorrow, which is um, at the same time and called Contemporary Chefs and Culinary Transformations. Um, thanks for coming, Greg. Cool, thank you. Um, I was really impressed by the array of um, papers and the issues that they brought up and which works with the title, how they converged. Um, so I'm gonna start by actually bringing up uh, some of the questions that came up for me as I was thinking about how these papers work together. And then what I'll do is I'll go to some of my more individual comments and I'll leave out the ones for Amir and uh, Sam and I'll send it to them uh, separately. So first, there's the idea of what a chef is or who counts as a chef. Um, you know, how a chef is different from a cook and how a contemporary chef is different from um, chefs in the past. So part of it is that chefs are supposed to be really impactful today and engaged. Um, and I've been wondering why there's this expectation for chefs today to be um, involved in so many different aspects of human life. And, you know, how that comes out of food's role in social life, whether it be environmental, um, related to labor, economic issues, um, or ethical issues. Related to this, there's um, the issue of how we judge success for chefs. Um, in uh, Senia's words, I guess, what's the potential payoff um, when a chef consciously engages with these other dimensions? Um, or what counts as meaningful change, more in uh, Dan Barber's words? Um, meanwhile, uh, what does it mean when a chef refuses to engage, and what are the consequences? So related to all this as well, um, in a number of these papers, we've seen how chefs are telling stories 
and how stories are being told about them that they may or may not have a degree of control over. But chefs also exist within communities where they are trying to represent um, some communities, but also there are other people who are left out of the stories. And I think it's critical to pay attention to that element as well. In addition, as um, Amir and Sam paid attention to in the last paper, um, all of these stories have audiences, uh, which is really another piece. So I guess I'll start next by going to the individual elements. I'll start with Lee's. Um, so I think the media aspect, obviously, um, is one that has to be addressed because it's so, I guess we exist in a media saturated society and for these chefs, it's really, they are inextricable from that. I would like to hear more about the negative side of this media omnipresence um, or the evil side of the necessary evil. Um, also, why do American consumers desire these stories, and how is authenticity constructed, or how are these claims to authenticity evaluated? So for Sin, um, I was really fascinated by how the senses and cultural notions played into um, this idea of transformation and the passage between categories. Um, and also how chefs and scientists can really play with this. I would be curious to hear about how those in the Nordic food movement see themselves not just defining what Nordic means, but also what food does, what Nordic food should look, feel, smell, sound, taste, move like, um, not to mention issues of you know, labor and sustainability. Um, also, if it's seen as an imperative to eat insects, uh, how is there outreach happening, you know, to convince people you need to eat this? For Amanda, um, I really like the attention that you paid to chefs' perspectives. There's a lot of rich data there and nuance, especially in the observation that identity can be limiting and the idea of chefs being in an uncomfortable position and almost refusing uh, to answer things. Um, as a very detailed question, I would like to know more about this uh, traditional knowledge passed from grandparents down. Um, I was surprised by that. And I'm wondering if that has anything to do also uh, with maybe the difference between a chef and a cook in some ways, and if and this is just total uh, supposition, but um, if maybe sometimes people refuse to answer questions as a chef to take on that authority, maybe because of the way that they acquired their knowledge. Um, additionally, uh, a central piece in your paper also had to do with this idea of tradition versus innovation which isn't always black or white, right? Um, and I think you start out with it more in the gray area and then you kind of get to it where it's more black or white. And I'd like to find out more about the rules for that and the tension between it, maybe what fuels the tension. So for uh, John, yours is a great example of what America today really expects from chefs in so many different dimensions, that they be activists, moral entrepreneurs, economic generators, tastemakers, celebrities, um, and the attention to historical change is, is really good. Um, why, I wonder, you know, do we turn to chefs today for, for such things? Um, and then I'd like to hear more about the wheat. What does it taste and feel like? What are the difficulties encountered in producing and processing uh, these kinds of heirloom varieties of wheat, especially when you think about issues of scale and replication. And here I'll come back to that idea of what counts as meaningful change. Um, 
I think it's good to be critical, <laughs> too, of, of these things. You know, w at what point can we say that something has been meaningful? What exactly are we looking for? And so those are my questions. Um, we can either open it up or uh, you can all sort of answer what you want to. Does anybody have any questions out there that they want to bring up for the world? Are you asking this to anybody specifically? <laughs> okay. Um, well, for my part, I would say that um, one of the tensions is because we don't know. Um, in the past, it used to be maybe to the gastronome, the person who was given the authority to make judgments about taste and then disseminate those accordingly. And now it's perhaps the person with the fastest fingers as opposed to the person who has invested their life in accruing matters of taste. So that's not to say that it's any better or worse. Um, it is to say that it is definitely more democratized and that our ideas of taste have to adapt to that. And one very good example is, of course, Instagram. All of the chefs that I worked with couldn't take a beautiful photo of their own food to save their lives. And most of the dishes that they made for photographs, as one would imagine, weren't exactly the tastiest dishes. Most things were undercooked so that they would um, stand upright or like give them a gloss at the end. Or, you know, a lot of these dishes you just mm. toss in the garbage right afterwards because they weren't edible. So that's one kind of good example of that. Sure. Also, just to tag on to that, there, there's also the gendered dimension to it, too. Lots of things to think about, yes. Um, I think that's what, why I use the word uncomfortable often, because they themselves are uncomfortable. They use the term chef, because that is what, um, and not all of them do, but the ones who get labeled as chef by the print media end up, and all digital media end up using that term. But a lot of them will also say, well, I'm not a chef. I'm not trained as a chef, as you say, like this Western idea of going to culinary school. I'm not trained as a chef. Um, but they work as chef. They're running restaurants and such. So there's, there's both.
not. Yeah, because they wouldn't want to be labeled that. Whereas um, one example is they have had uh, an annual best sh Sami chef competition. So a chef is mm. actually quite um, quite a wonderful thing to be as mm. well. It's something you compete to be the best in. So it is a little different. At the same time, they would agree that it's a imposi colonial imposition, um, a Western imposition. Yeah, it's interesting. That seems like a a different way of appropriating it as well, or mm -hmm. working with it. You know? Yeah, I yeah. see it a lot as like a customizing new, new ideas and making them their own. Mm -hmm. Cool. Any other uh, questions? Yes. By the way, as a sort of aside, if anybody has any questions that they, that they would like to send to Amir, um, either letting me or Lee know, um, we could put you in contact with them later. in a lot of ways, as all history is. Um, so I guess the question is, what you want the narrative to represent? Do you want the narrative to represent a feeling? Um, or do you want the narrative to represent the reality of the creation? So in the case of Fat Rice, that restaurant that is um, offering the food of Macau, it is extensively researched. Um, <coughs> they go to Macau you know, once every year, and look into the history of these culinary developments. And we're talking about a food that's gone from Portugal to Africa, to South Africa, to Indonesia, you know, and picked up little bits and pieces all along the way. So you have authenticity being already culled from a thousand different places. And then um, you have to take both these ingredients and these techniques and bring them all the way across the globe and at the same time, it's probably one of the few places that has attempted to replicate some of those experiences in a way that is through cuisine and therefore not represented all in one bowl like um, one of you guys talked about the in the Sami cuisine, yeah. So again, if it's evoking heritage in some ways, this bowl of fat rice that is incredibly beautiful um, and it has all the shrimp and the clams and everything on top of it is so visually representative of the heritage that they're trying to portray. And at the same time, it's not necessarily even in uh, its visual appeal authentic to what you would say it is at home. So. I guess, again, we, that's why I'm asking for us to think about what we really want out of it and know what we're getting as a result of what we're asking for. The other thing, right, is that whenever you're telling stories like this, there, there's the political element to it. And even if you're saying that the food speaks for itself, you know, there's so much that, you know, you could say the food could say. Um, Somebody's always being left out of that. Anybody else? Any other questions? Anything from, from you? I'm oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, go for it. Thank you. 
I'm going to say Greek. <laughs> yeah. I'll second that. <laughs> I don't know. For me, it's, I was, the whole idea for my paper came from listening to uh, this one talk at a conference in, uh, in Denmark, the MAD Symposium, uh, Symposia, which, uh, at which he spoke about this and the idea of wheat not having a flavor that, I don't know, it just, it seemed so wrong because flour is in so much of what we eat all the time and it really, it really tastes like such garbage. I mean, the, to answer your question about the bread that I tasted at, uh, at Blue Hill, I mean, chocolatey, malty, um, a little bit of spice, some underlying sweetness, and it was really just the most simple, basic bread recipe. I mean, flour, water, eggs, um, yeast, and that kind of stuff, but just based off the terroir from where the wheat was grown, I mean, you're just getting this whole range of complex flavors and aromas that are really just so striking, and I was just more, I don't know, that's just how wheat used to taste back in the day, and we've just only recently lost touch, uh, touch with that, that it just, I don't know, I guess I'm would like to raise more awareness about this in a way just because it really it's just such a basic staple in every kitchen pantry but it really is just not very good once you've tried the good stuff that it's really worth switching over if you ever get the opportunity yeah i mean that's for right now, with these heirloom varietals of wheat, it's incredibly, incredibly limited. Um, I mean, the only one that I, the only, I don't know, mill that I, where I know I can get this kind of wheat is Anson Mills uh, by Glenn Roberts, who's, I don't know, with Sean Brock down at Husk down in, uh, in the south and revital, revitalizing this whole culture. But I mean, it really is very closed off to much of American society. But in a way, I think that's why it's promi I don't know, it shows promise that Chipotle is getting involved with this, or at least interested in it. Because if this does work, I mean, it's Chipotle, it's huge, it's across the country, and I mean, that could really, I don't know, start reintroducing the American population to this idea of wheat having, as having flavor, and tortillas not just being some bland white thing to wrap your rice and beans and all that kind of stuff in. And I think this touches back on that question Greg raised of what do we expect of chefs? Are they also to be facilitating access, like promoting social sustainability in food systems, or are they there for our entertainment? <laughs> um. And sort of related to the question that was just asked is, I, I didn't bring this up, and I don't think really any of us did, but um, there are structural limitations to what chefs can do. So even though we have these expectations, um, for chefs, you know, paying attention to structural factors, you know, is also important, something we shouldn't overlook. And I, I think actually we've reached our uh, time limit. So uh, thank you all for um, coming. If you have any questions for anybody on the panel um, or for Amir, um, please come up and uh, talk to us now. But thank you for, thank you for coming.